Okay, I'm back. I've been writing to you guys quite regularly over on the canvas, uh, several hours a day, every day. And I, I hope I'm getting to everybody's comments. I may have missed one or two, but that's not been my intention. Uh, so I'll keep uh, working here in the form of videos and also over on Canvas in the form of commentary. So as I've been trying to do recently, I'm going to aim to keep this relatively short uh, out of respect for my own time and uh, energy, which is limited, and also out of respect for yours, which is equally limited. We're all really busy right now, uh, but uh, on we go. So I'm going to talk about Daniel heller and principally in this video, and I'll talk about Catherine Malibu a little bit more incidentally. Uh, the heller and was required reading as was the second of the two pieces by Catherine Malibu. The first one, I marked it as optional, though quite a number of you chose to read that. Now, the reason I marked it as optional is because it's exceedingly difficult. I have a hard time parsing through every sentence and trying to ascertain exactly what it's saying. Uh, that you would be able to do that would be inconceivable to me, though some of you uh, actually handled that much better than I, I thought you would. Uh, again, I didn't think you were going to even try to tackle that at all, so hats off to those of you who, who did get through that. The uh, Hellerowazen is uh, much easier, at least at first glance. I will say before diving into this material that... Uh, here we're looking at materials by two of the smartest people on the planet right now. You won't have heard of them because scholars, historians, philosophers honestly don't get much notoriety in this country, though uh, in other parts of the world they are celebrities of the highest order. And, and these are certainly intellectuals of the highest order. I won't give you much background on them, but... Uh, Heller and just for the record, he teaches at Princeton, and uh, not only does he teach at Princeton, which is something <laughs> in itself, I mean, that's a very, very illustrious and uh, difficult position to obtain, a full tenured professorship at uh, Princeton University. You know, you'd be lucky even to get in as an undergraduate, much less as a graduate student, much less to teach there. But uh, not only does he teach there, but he teaches in different languages, Un unheard of. You know, it's one thing to say that uh, you can speak two languages or even that you're fluent in two languages, which is another matter, but to think that you could stand uh, before a classroom and lecture 11 different languages, simply unreal. So uh, it might look like he's speaking about elementary matters here, but this is one of the best read and brightest people on planet Earth right now. And Catherine Malibu, uh, if possible, uh, she's even more illustrious than, than he is. I don't know that she has his number of languages, but uh, she's French by birth, uh, studied in the most prestigious universities with all the most illustrious professors and without name dropping I'll just say that when the most famous French philosopher in recent memory placed his mantle on the shoulders of a protege uh, it, it went to her there was a whole bunch of people who had been uh, preening themselves and jockeying for position to see who was going to carry on the legacy of the great man. And uh, lo and behold, it went to Catherine Malibu. So uh, she's second to none in terms of her pedigree, but she's also second to none in terms of the scope of her learning, which is initially in the philosophy of mind, but uh, for personal reasons as well as scholarly reasons, then began to branch out into 
not the conceptual investigation of the human mind, but the scientific investigation of the human brain. And it's the combination of these two related but quite different approaches to human consciousness, which uh, puts her out at the front of all kinds of research. So uh, I'm glad that I got a chance to assign both of these authors to you, and I hope you got something out of them. So now I'm going to jump right into the Heller Roazen, and we'll see how we do. So Tradition's Destruction on the Library of Alexandria, 2002. So uh, this is already starting to get a little bit dated, but uh, still it's written within this millennium. And uh, though this essay, I don't even know what to call it really, he calls it notes, uses the uh, ancient term notai, uh, the reason is uh, he's working in a very speculative fashion, and I'll, I'll get into why that's the case. But uh, he doesn't really want to put out a thesis because if he were to do that, he'd be suggesting that he knew something. And the whole point of this essay is that we don't know nearly as much as we think we do, and that state of unknowing may be one which is, quite frankly, inescapable. I won't even say he, he presents a hypothesis. What I do think he does is lay out a body of evidence in such a way that we can draw our own conclusions based on the materials he's provided. And he's arranged them in such a way that provisional conclusions are there to be made if, if we'd like to make them. But he'll begin his essay by citing a guy named Edward Gibbon. Now, you'll not have read him before, not have heard of him before, most likely. Uh, so I'll just tell you who he is. He's one of the great historians of the English Enlightenment. He's writing in the 1770s or so. So he would have been a contemporary with... Uh, the famous Adam Smith, author of The Wealth of Nations, and that was published in 1775, 1776, and Gibbon's writings would have been contemporary with that, though he's not writing on economic theory, he's writing on ancient history, and in particular, he's writing on ancient Rome. Uh, now, what he means by Rome is going to be something much more expansive than what most people mean by ancient Rome. But uh, in a massive book issued in, in multiple volumes, uh, he produces a text called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And he's going to talk about not a uh, punctual event, say 420 Adoas or uh, Sacks Rome, and that, that's the end of the Roman Empire. He's going to drag out the fall of the Roman Empire for, for many, many centuries. The, the point is that he's extremely well read in archival materials, and he is a very prolific or prolix writer. That simply means he's very wordy. And so you'd think that a historian who's interested in the downfall of at least one Western empire, some would say the the empire, uh, the definitive empire in the history of the West, the Roman Empire, somebody who was so verbose and so deeply interested in the fall of the Roman Empire would have had plenty to say on what would have been understood to be one of the key events in the decline of the Roman Empire, and that would have been the destruction of the Alexandrian Library. And yet when Gibbon, in the course of writing his history, gets to the events, and I'll, I'll quote Heller Oazen here, when he gets to these events, he says, I shall not recapitulate the disasters of the Alexandrian Library. And that's it. And for Heller Oazen, you know, this could look to be an understandable omission. Everybody knows what went on in ancient Alexandria. I certainly do. I remember the first time I learned about the Library of Alexandria. I was probably six years old. I was going to the dentist to have my teeth cleaned for the first time or something like that. And while you're waiting there in the 
waiting room. There's a book stacked up since it was a dentist that worked with kids. There was kids' magazines and books stacked up, and I picked up one called A Young Person's History, Young Person's Guide to History or something like that, the history of the world. And uh, I remember distinctly seeing a illustration of a big building, some type of a tower in flames, one of the great disasters in the history of the world. So, you know, if I knew this from six, everybody's heard of this before. Uh, and so we could excuse Gibbon's glib dismissal of the library, thinking, well, everybody knows that, so why bother to uh, recapitulate it? But Heller Oazen uh, sees here a kind of a uncomfortable avoidance of a topic which, even though 2,000 years have passed between the time of the Alexandrian Library and Gibbon's day, there's this unacknowledged discomfort regarding what happened and what we do and don't know about it. So the, the technical term for this is going to be denegation. It's when the fact that you're unwilling to talk about something doesn't mean that there's nothing to say, but rather that denial is covering over the fact that there's actually a whole world to, of, of issues most of them highly problematic, which uh, are lingering just below the surface. The denial is, in a way, an unwitting admission that uh, you're deeply disturbed about something. So if, if you went into therapy for the first time and never, somebody said, well, so tell me how you get along with your mother. And you, oh, no, we're doing great. No problem there at all. Th that doesn't mean that, fine, we can move on to another subject. But your therapist is going to see this as indication of the fact that you've got a lot of unresolved resolved issues, and we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, this disavowal, that's Heller Oazen's term, uh, indicates that there's something so uncomfortable, so disturbing about what happened in the Alexandrian library that even Gibbon doesn't want to go there. And so Heller Oazen, being curious, being the historian, or the proper term would be philologist, Philologists are people who, taking existing documents, uh, use them to try to reconstruct what it was possible to think, feel, experience in antiquity. We're trying to get um, not just factual knowledge, but we're trying to get the sensibility of, of what it might have been like to live in uh, prior time. And so Heller Oazen, being a philologist, is going to dive back into this story. And he's going to try to figure out what happened that, that continues to make somebody like Gibbon 2,000 years later uh, so uncomfortable that he doesn't even want to talk about it. In forensic fashion, he will uh, take out, he'll reopen the case, he's going to re-examine the evidence, and the first thing that he will notice is, uh, considering this is one of the most famous and most commonly understood events in Western history, we have surprisingly scant evidence upon which to base our knowledge, which now is beginning already just to look like assumptions rather than facts. And further, when we look at the very little bit of evidence that we do have, the next thing that we noticed is most of the evidence is contradictory. So we're going to have to try to reconstruct in one way or another, uh, as it were, the scene of the crime. Uh, the fancy pants term for this is going to be abduction. We're going to follow the trail back to figure out what happened on that fateful night. So if you used to watch like CSI or crime shows like that, and uh, I think some of you have, because uh, I, was, I was talking with a student the other day about some of the new majors on campus, which uh, I'm noticing when I take role and ask people what they study. And one of the new majors on campus now is criminology. I'd never heard of that uh, even two, three years ago. And I've got more budding criminologists than ever. Maybe this is a reflection of the fact that everybody listens to podcasts now. One of the most famous genres of podcasts seems to be true crime. And then those podcasts maybe are the result of uh, 
true crime series on TV. Uh, in, in any case, uh, criminology is a big deal. Forensic investigations that are, or crime scene investigations, that you want to lay out the site so you, you cordon it off, uh, you create a grid on top of the site, and then you begin meticulously to comb through the evidence. So uh, Heller Rosden's going to do that, as it were, looking first at the geography of Alexandria. And uh, the thing that he notices first is that uh, the, the city is supposed, according to uh, certain statements in the existing literature that we have, the city is laid out to look like uh, a clamis, uh, the mantle worn by Macedonian and thus. The Sally and hunters and soldiers. So be some type of a rap or something like that. Now, he won't use the word uh, that we might use today uh, because it doesn't come from the Greek. It comes from the Spanish. But the way you might think of a clamus is as a poncho. That's a Spanish word. But a poncho is going to be a blanket. And the only thing that distinguishes it between a blanket is the fact that there's a hole in the middle of it. And I, I think this is actually kind of interesting. The thing that makes the poncho what it is, the thing that makes a poncho a poncho, is the hole at the center. And what is a hole made out of? A hole's made out of nothing. So when you add nothing to a blanket, that becomes the constitutive action through which you create the poncho. Its most important component is nothing. Uh, now, why do I think this is so important? Because one of the key terms that, uh, although I don't believe Hellerowazen uses it ever in the text, he's, he's absolutely got it in mind. One of uh, the key terms that's operating silently here is the Latin word lacuna. Uh, it's where we get the word lagoon from. And as you will notice, if you did the reading, that as a matter of fact, the port city of Alexandria, the one of the, well, one of the, most likely the wealthiest city in the ancient world, far more magnificent than Rome. No, no doubt about that. Rome would have looked like a shambles compared to this place. Uh, but it's, it's built around a lagoon, as ports generally are. You know, there's some, some type of a recess in the shore that allows boats to anchor and dock there. Uh, but the, the word, again, for uh, lagoon is lacuna. Uh, there's a number of other words or, or uses for the word lacuna, and one by one by one, I think you'll see them all brought in to Hellerowazen's discussion. So a lacuna is also, if you are a philologist or if you're a paleographer, paleographer is the term for people who don't read books the way that you and I do, you know, get a, sent to you in the mail from Amazon or you go to the library and take them out. Or, you know, once upon a time, people went to bookstores. Well, people don't even use libraries anymore now except as a study space and as a, as a lunch space. But once upon a time, people would check books out of the library, and those books are established text. Somebody has had to take the original manuscript and make sure that what the author wrote by hand is all transcribed correctly into the form of print. If there are multiple manuscripts, then we're going to have to decide, do we go with this variation of the text or do we go with that variant text? Uh, and eventually we will come up with an established edition of the text and that's what gets published, printed, and that you and I buy as textbooks for other classes. But the paleographer is going to be the person who sits down with the actual handwritten manuscript and combs over it trying to figure out what it actually says. And, you know, if, if handwriting in the past uh, is as sloppy as handwriting in the present, you know, this is, this is a very difficult thing to do, you know. You, 
I have to go to the doctor today to pick up a prescription, and you know, I've seen his handwriting. How the pharmacist reads that, I have no idea. Uh, but a paleographer would take a very long manuscript written by hand and try to ascertain exactly what uh, the manuscript said. So anyhow, the lacuna is going to be in an ancient manuscript. And these things are written on brittle paper or they're written in non-fast which is to say non-fixed ink, which is subject to fading and flaking and things like that. A lacuna is going to be some space in the text in which there's literally a hole. It could be a wormhole. It could be that, that the papyrus crumbled there. It could be that the ink simply faded or flaked away, as I said. And so as you're reading along, suddenly there's a hole in the text and it's the job of the scholar, or the term they use here is critic, to fill in the lacuna. And uh, this is a, a mighty endeavor. When I was studying ancient Greek oh so long ago, my teacher asked us uh, if we'd ever seen an original manuscript. And the reason he asked this is, a lot of times when you're looking at published editions, especially student editions, there are going to be brackets as you're reading through the text of a play or of a speech or something like that. And what, if you're curious, you'll wonder what are these brackets doing there? Those brackets represent a place where subsequent scholars have tried to guess what might have been inside of the lacuna and this is purely speculative work so anyway uh, my teacher knowing just how riddled with lacunae ancient manuscripts are uh, he, he couldn't bring in an ancient manuscript they're too delicate and too valuable but he brought in a facsimile of an ancient manuscript and you wouldn't believe what it looked like. I mean, it, it looked like a piece of paper towel that somebody had used to clean up after a party. It was stained and smeared. There were holes everywhere. And my thought immediately was, well, how do you get from this to that? I, how, how do you get from this shredded mess to this shiny and seemingly complete uh, text that we see in our book. And he says, that's exactly it. That's what nobody wants to tell you. That what you're reading here in this established for sale textbook, it, there's a whole complex process involving multiple operations and numerous persons involved in heated debate with one another over what the original actually looked like. But this is all uh, the critical work involved in filling in the lacunae. Uh, so there's that use of the word. Another term for lacuna, if you're into um, psychology and psychiatry at all, is a blank space in your memory. And we all know what this is about. Somebody asks you in a deposition, where were you the night of February 2nd? Uh, 2015. <laughs> I can't remember. And the, the very fact that you don't remember or that you don't remember accurately, again, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, may not indicate that nothing remarkable happened that night. It may well indicate that what happened that night is so disturbing to you. Still, that you're having to create either a blank or you're having to create an altered version of what happened that night because you still can't come to terms with just how real shit got. So um, this is a lacuna. It's, it's an empty space or a blank in your memory. And then another term for lacuna that I'll use, and I think it's important in this text too, because although when you think about the holdings of the Library of Alexandria, you imagine that it would have been mostly literary, well, they didn't have hard and fast distinctions back then between what was literature 
and what was philosophy and what was history and what was science. In, in a way, it's in Alexandria that this, these distinctions into different genres of writing are being created for the first time. Anyway, my point is that there weren't just plays and poems held in the Library of Alexandria, but there were also medical writings. And you'll see that uh, the Hippocratic writings were held in the library. And one of the people who worked in the library was the famous Roman physician Galen, who gave us the theory of the humors about bile and stuff like that that you probably heard about at some point in, in high school. So uh, medical researchers were there, and they would have been interested in this notion of a lacuna too. A lacuna in medical terms is going to be that empty space in a body which, so far as we know, plays no functional role. It just happens to be an empty space uh, in between various tissues and organs. So we've got the geographical definition of a lacuna. We've got the textual definition of lacuna. We've got the psychological definition of a lacuna. And we've got the medical definition of a lacuna. And I think all of these things are going to be in play in this text. What I'm trying to suggest is everything that we see in Heller Rosen's writing and everything that we uh, think we know about what happened in ancient Alexandria in one way or another is going to be constituted upon or around some central loss, some central gap, some central lack, some central void, uh, which, though it appears to be made out of nothing, nevertheless is absolutely constitutive of the thing surrounding it. So uh, actually, this is already getting more complicated and, and interesting than people might have imagined when they were reading this.